<laughs> Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray, another edition here of BDR TV. And I am here, as you guys know, with some amazing entrepreneurs. They brought cannabis products and other products to market over the years. And I'd like to introduce Keith Huffman, who's over here on, on the screen. Uh, Just, Justin is below me, and Otha is a uh, caddy corner for me. How are you guys doing? Very doing good. Well. Thank doing you. Great. You know, I want to thank you guys for being on the on the interview show. You guys have done some amazing things. And what I'd like to do is is uh, ask you some questions. But first, let's go around here, starting with Keeve. Spend about a minute and talk about you know what your company is and what you're up to. And we'll go around uh, the screen here, and then we'll get into some questions. Sure, great. Well, thanks for having me on, Ben. Uh, so my company is called Engager, and Engager is a portfolio of cannabis brands that are focused on lifestyles. And we right now currently have two primary brands. Uh, one of them is currently very active in the California market, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later. And my back, I've been in the industry now uh, for seven years and have worked in media, uh, content, agency, uh, branding, and I'm kind of taken all of that experience and have now applied it to these uh, new brands that I'm launching under my umbrella company, which is called Engager. It's awesome. Oh, Otha? Yeah, so Otha Smith here. Thanks again, Ben, for letting me join today. Um, I'm the CEO of Tetragram. And so Tetragram is a free mobile app that really empowers medical and recreational users by giving them the ability to keep track of all the various cannabis CBD products that they purchase, where they made the purchase, and then they can associate that product with a medical condition so that they can start to draw conclusions on what products are working best because there's just so many products in the marketplace today. You know, you go into a dispensary and most people, whether you're new to cannabis or you know, you've been used, you know, using cannabis for years, you know, it's an intimidating process. So with our application, it really helps you document all these different products that you explore and be able to draw better conclusions on what's working. Awesome. Uh, Justin, yeah, jump in. All right. Thanks for having me, Ben. Um, so I, I run BudsFeed.com, founder and CEO. Uh, BudsFeed is a platform for sharing uh, the latest and uh, greatest cannabis related products and services. Um, we encourage enthusiasts and brands to come and share, um, you know, their experiences with products on our platform. Um, and, and when brands are launching something new to make it a part of their launch strategy. So uh, we get exposed to a lot of cool, interesting stuff happening in the cannabis industry. Um, in addition to interviewing a lot of the, uh, um, you know, some of the top executives in the space right now in, in our how it started interviews. So um, it's been pretty exciting. It's, uh, it's, you know, not quite a platform, not quite a social, uh, sorry, not quite a social platform and not quite a, um, a publisher, something in between. And it's, uh, it's a pretty cool and powerful tool for discovering new products. So you're a social publisher. Yeah. You know, yeah. break the go. mold. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Well, great. Well, you guys have amazing experience and I'd, I'd like to use this time to explain to the, the viewers and listeners really some challenges, how you overcame those, and then really some advice for entrepreneurs or anyone who wants to launch a product in the canvas space. So my first question, and this is in no order, this is really a panel discussion, you know, what was the main barrier or challenge uh, that you guys faced when you were uh, launching your product into the cannabis market specifically? Scale. Um, I, I would go out and just say, you know, when you're when you're talking about cannabis, while it is definitely exploding right now, I think a lot of us coming from a traditional industry, whether it's Oda and Natural uh, Resources or Keeve and in, in, in a lot of the bigger brands that maybe he's worked on in the advertising industry and music industry, um, it's still very small and everything's a startup. And so uh, understanding that you're dealing at something that's still in its infancy um, and how to approach that, right? You're not working with the Frito-Lays of the world yet. We're just not there yet in terms of size. So, um, you know, for me, you know, I had to realize a lot of it's about community and really engaging grassroots where you're at um, to build the base of, of your following. 
Yeah, and I agree with what Justin said. You know, <laughs> when we had finished uh, developing Tetragram and had the bow on it and we're about to launch it, COVID hit. So we really were like, what do we do now? Um, you know, unfortunately, so, you know, that was a very unfortunate event. But, you know, after talking to different medical advisors and this dispensary staff, COVID actually presented a great time for Tetragram because so many people were really focused on their mental and physical health. Um, so that played in well in terms of gaining traction with Tetragram. But, you know, like Justin mentioned, given that this is an industry that is still very much in its infancy and since cannabis is still federally illegal, we don't have the traditional ways of marketing our products to the consumer like other channels. And so, you know, the grassroots community uh, engagement is really key to scaling your company and getting more awareness out there. Great. Yeah, for, for our, we have a, have a little bit of a different perspective just because we're launching brands in the California market. And so there are some unique challenges and, you know, every state, you know, that you're launching in has its own unique challenges. Uh, but if you're if you're launching cannabis specific products, obviously it's state by state right now. And in California, there are a number of uh, of unique you know uh, challenges that that we constantly have. So one of the, the biggest ones is just the whole supply chain, you know. And it's it kind of gets to what Justin was speaking of earlier is that you know because this is such a nascent industry, you're dealing with a lot of companies that are all essentially startups, right, at the, at the end of the day. And as a result, what you're dealing with quite often are, you know, the bumps that, that come with dealing with startups. You know, a lot of these companies maybe go out of business, you know, uh, or conveniently forget that they signed a contract with you or that they mm -hmm. owe you money uh, or, you know, there's all different kinds of, of, of situations. But I would say that the, the, the biggest challenge is making sure that you really manage your supply chain effectively. And then really at the end of the day, because we don't have a robust sales, you know, uh, and distribution uh, network currently, like for instance, there's no such thing as shopper marketing programs, you know, which there are in pretty much every other, in, you know, industry in the world. Um, there's no kind of centralized hub for distribution. It's very much boots on the ground, get, getting into the, a lot of these shops still are, you know, mom and pop operations, you know, getting into those. And it takes a lot of, you know, roll up your sleeves and just get out there and making sure that you are providing something to those dispensaries in our case, uh, that is going to be meaningful for their audience, you know, and is going to work for them. And, qu and quite frankly, at the end of the day, is going to help drive foot traffic into their stores. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, this still is a very localized industry uh, where it is, it's, you know, I, I think Otha touched on it, you know, uh, and we, we recognize this at my former company, uh, Prohibited, which was when we were creating videos, People are like, oh, how do I get more eyeballs onto my videos? I'm like, well, you can't advertise on Facebook or on Google or any of the other traditional channels that you would normally use. So we had to actually build our own multi-platform network that you know we were then able to, to, to show the videos on. And that's pretty much where we're still at with this industry, where it's like, if, if there isn't a solution today, you actually have to create your own solution oftentimes uh, to get around a lot of these unique challenges that we're we have by, you know, as Otha said, this is still a federally illegal product. And so as a result of that, we've got an incredible amount of unique challenges that anyone coming from other industries uh, are, are going to be in for a real eye opening. You know? <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can assure you. No, I, I would agree with that. All these uh, pictures, all these brands behind me are ones that I've worked with over the years. In addition to about 15 cannabis brands consulting and doing digital advertising, and marketing for, and these brands here are very easy. You say, what can we do? And there, right. you know, there are a hundred things that you can do in the, in the cannabis industry. It's what can't we do? And you have to work within those parameters. You know, so like you said, everything's localized. So if you're going to the internet, the internet is global, but you can't promote on the internet. A lot of times, let's say Facebook, or let's say even Instagram, you build up big mm -hmm. followers with cannabis brand. It can be taken down or red flagged or whatever it is with no notice. You know, so you have to do a lot of 
uh, what can't we do, and then work within those parameters legally. And so it's a much smaller channel to you know choose from um, or smaller channels. And Keith, you're right. You do have to <laughs> invent your own ways to connect meaningfully with your your consumers or or partners or whatever it is. And a lot of that is just you know localized brand engagement, whatever that is, whether it's reaching out just with emails or going to events or things like that. And and really the the same principles are there, like lifestyle. But the mediums to reach those people through your messaging is completely, completely different. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, in 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 like Kiev's world in particular, like it has to move units. Like that's what they care about. They are literally a brick and mortar store. It has to move units, mm -hmm. and that's how that's how the entire smoke shop industry is too. Even outside of, you know, if it takes up precious shelf space, it's got to move. Yep. And that's, that's where right. your marketing's got to be focused on. You know, we're, we're going to talk about uh, advice uh, for entrepreneurs to get products, but um, we've got a question here, and I think it's applicable now. So, Keeve, this is for you. Found that California is the pioneer in the evolution of the cannabis space. Um, you, have, uh, you have to be creative with your own solution with that marketing platforms that are competing for the same audience on a local level. What kind of advice would you give your future clients or startups in newer onboarding states? Great question. It, unfortunately, there's no cookie cutter answer for this because honestly, every single state is unique. Yeah, there are no consistencies state to state, or there's some, but you know, there's a lot more differences oftentimes. And then on top of that, these states are constantly changing their regulations. It's an, yeah. it's an ever evolving, you know, it's a moving target, you know, on, you know, I can, I can tell you that we, when we, we had, um, we had some uh, different products that we were launching a, a couple of years ago and basically California, the state came out and said, Oh, we're no longer going to allow for white labeling of, of, of brands, which was basically, my entire business model, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual property holder. That's kind of what I do is I, I want to partner with with other partners. And so we had to put all of our launch plans on hold until it kind of worked through the system. And then, you know, six months later, said, oh, no, no, that's not what we really meant. You know, you can actually still do this. And, you know, it's just it's it's a, it's an ever evolving situation. So unfortunately, I couldn't say give you really any blanket advice for how to launch in other states what i would say is that when you're looking at every single state i think some of the consistencies are and it's kind of it's really harkens back to what justin was saying at the end of the day you've kind of got two main customers here right you're you're in consumer so you want to make sure that you're actually offering a product into market that that consumers actually want you know, and that's a, that's a big thing I see with a lot of people is like, oh, I have this cool idea or, you know, or I've got, you know, there's a lot of great ideas, but at the end of the day, they haven't really done the research to make sure that there's other people that actually care about that idea or, you know, or want those products. So making sure that you've actually got products that people want and then cr creating uh, innovative programs. And there's a lot of different ways that you can work. And it depends on each of the states that will actually move your units in these in these in these stores right on a store by store basis like if these store owners these dispensary owners these smoke shops whatever whatever products you're offering th those are your most important customers because if you're serving them well then they're going to keep stocking your units they're going to keep you know and you're going to be able to build up some momentum so I think it's really coming up with a plan on how you're going to kind of serve those those two audiences. So it's, it's kind of challenging, at least, and I'm talking more of like, you know, these products that are physically going to be in stores, but you almost have, you know, typically when you launch something, you're either, you're either B2B or B2C, but you actually have to kind of think of it with both hats on for these things because yes, you have a, you have a direct consumer offering that you're, you're, you're putting out into the market, but if you're not super serving your business partners and, and working really strongly on a B2B front, then you're not going to be successful. Yep. Yeah. Did you guys, uh, uh, Otho or Justa, you have any um, response to that about different states? Now, I know you guys aren't as much physical, although 
uh, and somewhat Justin, you have launched physically. What do you guys say about that? About you know what would the onboarding in different states be? The challenges and how'd you solve those or recommendations? Yeah, I mean, from our from our perspective, being um, an app company, a tech company, you know, we still have the same issues with each market and each market meeting each state. So, like here in Maryland, it was very easy for me to create awareness because our business customer is both, you know, the B two C and the B two B, and so. You know, we really had to create relationships with each dispensary, boots on the ground, knocking on each dispensary door and establishing those relationships. And then, you know, with dispensaries prior to COVID doing pop up events and just reaching out to different marketing um, avenues to engage with the customer, we had to sleeve ourselves in that way as well. But as Tetragram is growing in other states, you know, one of the things that we find beneficial to growing our awareness is that we got to have somebody who is a resident of that state because it's very hard to penetrate and create relationships with the dispensary by just picking up the phone. You know, these guys are running a mile a minute. And so you really need to have someone who has the ability, you know, in medical markets where you have to be a resident to enter that dispensary, create that conversation and then, you know, establish a relationship. Yeah. So it's very challenging. And I just say that you know, for me, the advice that I would definitely give is make sure you have boots on the ground in each state that is more medically focused um, or medical only because you're going to need someone who is a resident that can penetrate that market more effective than you picking up the phone or shooting off emails. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, especially in Oza's case, like having a having a field team becomes super important of some sort because these I mean, like my parents run a liquor store, right? It's the exact same thing. Those people are working hard. They're stocking shelves. It's literally a retail store. So um, to build relationships with them, you know, all those other companies are sending in people once a month to do checks on their inventory, just like you would if you were facing Pepsi at a mini market, you know? So the relationships are really hard to establish. I would say, um, A, figure out what you're good at and what you want to do in the market look at the legislation happening in the market where you live. Like if you already drive a car all day long and you have a bunch of buddies that drive cars all day long, maybe you could start a delivery service. Look at what's gonna be allowed in your market, follow it closely and uh, penetrate the holes that are left in it. And, and, you know, that's what, you know, Jersey is an interesting, you know, I would also look at New York. I think New York is gonna set the standard for a lot of stuff, especially on the East Coast, like as Maryland starts to fall, we have a lot of the similar problems here on the East Coast with things like um, making sure that there's day one equity programs right out of the get go. Illinois has done a decent job of this too, but you know, like it's a it's a very East Coast um, structure. So if you are on on the East Coast, for instance, think about um, you know some of the laws that are being launched here. I know some people that created a, a, a an ISO certified lab two years ago, thinking it was going to pass two years ago, and then it passed the next year in New Jersey. But they're they're now way ahead. They're the only lab that can test THC, CBD, you know, any of these uh, cannabinoids. So it's really um, dependent on what you do and where you're at and really looking at the legislation to determine where you can um, take advantage of it. No, I'd say the, the takeaway is really relationships and location, you know, so it's very hard to do things unless you're breaking bread, you know, like all of us have talked and we all value relationships. So wherever you are, make sure those are meaningful and, and build those relationships over time. Well, the, the second topic here is really about positioning. And, and the last question uh, kind of made me think about this. So, you know, how did you guys position your product launch for the most conversion? And what I mean by that is, do you focus on the niche or do you go broad? And I know there's opinions on both sides. Um, Keith, let's start with you because of, you know, I know that you're in the, in the niche camp, but I'd love to hear kind of pros and cons to each. All about the niches. Uh, I feel like the niches have been completely uh, underserved. And that's where I see as the biggest opportunities when it comes to uh, when it comes to the cannabis uh, product of brands. Uh, most of the products to date are created based on you know, I'm a cultivator, I'm a manufacturer, and I have these products I'm producing, I need to get these products into stores, so I'm going to put a logo on it. And they're not really approaching things from like, who is my target customer? 
who's the, who's the demo that I'm going after and then working backwards from that. That's the way that, that we're working and we're focusing on lifestyles. So for instance, our first brand is a brand called Heavy Grass and it is focused on the hard rock heavy metal lifestyle. It's like the Jack Daniels of weed, basically. And there is no other brand right now that's going after that demo. And we, you know, it's it's an enormous, it over, greatly over indexes on cannabis consumption. And we've been working events uh, over the last year. Uh, well, not over the last year, the year prior, uh, you know, the last year, obviously with COVID, we weren't able to work the events. <laughs> um, Mind boggling. They're coming back, by the way, uh, in a big way. We're looking, at least out here, I know in California, we're looking at the festivals and the concerts are going to be hitting back in full force in late summer and the fall. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Uh, so anyway, we we would go to these these festivals and literally we could we had the longest lines out of any of these places out of any of these activation booths because people would come and say, like i we've been waiting for you right it's the first time that there's a can't like i'm a consumer i'm a bit i'm a metal fan and no one's there's no brand that speaks to me right so, so and there you're, are so you're you would say that the brand is speaking directly to them so what they're interested in and that could be in sports it could be edm music it could be any hyper localy or hyper niche where you can di speak directly to the wants, desires, and needs of that audience and then work backward to build the brand to fulfill those needs. Yeah, I think you can pretty much just take a dartboard out and like put a bunch of different, you know, niche demos up there. I'd say that probably, you know, look, the the most overserved demos are, you know, the 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 hardcore, you know, dabber community you know uh like i call the stoner dudes you know and then um and then there's the the the, the hip-hop community you know there's been like a ton of like these brands where you know every it seems like every rapper wants to have their own strain or their own you know their own brand but you know for the most part you know maybe here and there you'll, you're starting to see some brands that are going after you know the housewives and some of these other different things and i think some of these brands are actually doing a very good job with that but i feel you know and our company feels that you know the big opportunity here are around going after these targeted niches um and creating products that speak to them and authentic and connect with them in an authentic way um, and I think ultimately those will be the brands that win in the long term, because I think the other reason why brands have been created the way they have to date, it's a, it's a very practical one. It's like, I can only sell in this local market anyway, right? So I need to create a brand that's going to work for this specific market. We're building brands that are going to appeal globally, you know, so we're kind of playing the long game here and there's some short term challenges to that. But I believe there's long term payoffs where if you can super serve a niche audience that has uh, reach in multiple states, multiple countries, then you're going to be very well positioned for uh, long term success. Great. Justin Ota. Yeah. yeah, I would say niche for Tetragram, you know, um, Tetragram, again, being an app that gives people the ability to start to understand what products work. Uh, most effectively for them, especially medical conditions. So we're more of a niche in terms that we really spend a majority of our time focused on that medical customer, uh, which is a big po portion of the market because those are the ones that are going to be more inclined to make sure that every product that they buy, they log that experience in the Tetragram after using that product so that they can understand what is working best for them. But, you know, we are looking at Tetragram in the future as something that will be more of a broad appearance because you know, as we incorporate new features in the Tetragram and versions two and next generations, you know, we have some key features that I would love to talk about, but uh, stealth is wealth in this game. So uh, we will keep those under wraps. But, you know, these features are really going to expand so that our audience will only, will not only be just a medical customer, but also the recreational user as well. But, you know, this industry has done a great job of making sure that education is always at the forefront. And so when we were developing Tetragram, we were like, man, we got all these different features that we want to incorporate into the app. But the thing is, when you start off by throwing a kitchen sink at someone, you know, especially in technology, they look at the app and they're like, what am I supposed to do here? 
So, you know, again, we tapped into the vein of that niche of saying, well, every dispensary, every medical professional recommends to a customer, whether you're recreational or not, to keep a journal, write it down. It's the only way you're going to keep track of what's working. And so with this first version that we brought to market, we made sure that that was the only thing that we addressed. And we wanted to perfect that process of giving people the ability to keep track of this medicine that they're utilizing. And then over time, you start to incorporate new features so that, you know, you can attract a broader audience. Right. So that was your M MVP. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I love this answer just because it's, um, and, and, and key too, you know, it's all about finding in the person that cares, right? like oh there's asking somebody to do something like use the app they have to put work into it so who actually cares enough to do that somebody dealing with chronic pain cancer aids um you know some sort of ptsd where they're really trying to track what's helping them that's going to provide a bet you know uh, uh a ton of data in the future that they can use to market hey we know what all these different things do for people you know and it's it's all about finding the person that cares uh, in my in my case, you know, I think everybody expected me to come out and be like, "Oh, how many page views are you getting? How many video views are you getting?" And and really, what I what I set out to do was to meet everyone in the cannabis industry, right, and create a platform that I don't charge for that provides everyone value. It has a ton of consumer value over time, but for me, my my audience is entrepreneurs. So I'm pursuing people who are creating cool new products, startups that want to build backlinks to their website, want to get exposed to a new community, just get some feedback on a cool idea. So um, I would say that I'm very niche too, and that um, Oda and Kiev are like my target audience. Benjamin, you're my target audience. People that are coming up with stuff in this space because we're all startups. And I come from the advertising and, and um, most recently the tech space where um, you know you think about Slack and and all of these other apps that have built over time, like that was all based on this really ravenous um, uh, startup uh, uh, community, you know, kind of modern web apps and 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 mobile applications that started working together, and uh, you know I think that that's gonna, what's going to start happening in the in the cannabis space. There's so much innovation happening every day; it's almost on the rate of how fast people are launching new apps into the app store, right? Yeah. New strains, new genetics, new uh, derivative products. Like, you know, Akiva is creating something for a specific audience using stuff that, you know, uh, a product he knows that they'll like, but also a brand that they can uh, endorse. Um, you know, whether it's just a brand being created or it's something that's completely new hitting the marketplace. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's pretty exciting. And I want to talk to every single one of those entrepreneurs that's uh, launching something new into the world. Yeah, right. Ingenuity at its finest right now. That's, yeah, sure. that, that's right. We've got a, another question uh, here from uh, Tiversio, and, and I'm, I'm going to read the bottom part of it here for you guys. Um, so it's about Darwinism. So uh, that's his theory. So he, his question is, are brands eating up distribution licenses or are distribution eating up brands for greater messaging footprint? It's a good question. Um, there's, two, there's two ways that that's happening. I mean, some of them are getting distribution licenses everywhere. Like if you're talking about the, the cure leafs of the world and stuff like that, other brands like Cookies simply do licensing deals um, and continue to build their brand or they release CBD or functional mushrooms to continue to extend their brand into markets where they can't sell THC uh, rich cannabis yet. So um, I would say that there's a couple ways it's happening. One thing is for sure, there are a lot of big players in the cannabis industry right now. Some of them will fail and don't be surprised if you see Unilever or uh, another you know, major um, personal goods company come in and swoop that up, especially in the near term if it's one of these big guys in the CBD space. I just I just saw something the other day where the CEO of Uber said well, that they they were ready to jump in, you know, when the time was right. Yeah. And talk about a disruptor for all these delivery services. You know, it's going to be tough to compete with Uber when they when they jump in. I mean, I know that to, to kind of riff on your point, Justin. You know, 
that uh, prohibited, we were talking to a lot of these, um, you know, big media companies, a lot of CPG companies, and all the MA guys there were, you know, chomping at the bit. They were like, look, we would be full in this game right now, but our lawyers won't let us. And so you better believe that as soon as that de-risking happens, you know, which I think we all anticipate will be happening, you know, over the next, you know, two to four years, they're going to come in full force. Um, you know, my, my take on the, on the whole brand thing is, look, I mean, I think there's, there's two different ways you can do it. And, you know, one is, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be vertically integrated right now. There's a lot of efficiencies there. There's a lot of, a, a con, a, a, it makes sense economically. Um, Personally, I, I don't believe it's a super scalable model. So that's why I focus on the licensing side of things because I can be much more nimble with, with my brands and really take those brands everywhere. And I'm not really dependent even on how quickly federal legalization happens or doesn't happen. Um, we can really be a lot more nimble. Um, so we're focused less on uh, getting our own licenses and more on just making sure that we're building meaningful brands that connect with audiences in a meaningful way that we can then just kind of work within whatever the, the current landscape is and not be saddled with, you know, in, in some of these enormous, you know, unfortunately to be vertically integrated, that means you have to, you have to pay for these licenses. You have to maintain these licenses. You have to have these facilities, you know, they're, you know, real estate, you know, there's, there's just a lot of, um, which is why you're seeing a lot of these bigger, um, bigger players that are coming in. They are buying a lot of these vertically integrated things. But I think you know an interesting thing uh, that just was announced was with that SPAC for you know which Jay Z is kind of the face of. But it's you know it's it's, it's essentially you know they came in, they bought it, they bought it in Left Coast and, and Kaliba. Um, but their their model, if you actually go and read what they're it's like, look, we're building these brands in California, and then we're going to aggressively license them everywhere else. So they're vertically integrated only in California, and then they're going to license out everywhere else. Appropriately named the parent company. The parent company, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I would agree with Keith. Like you can, I, I think an easy point of entry if you're really, especially if you're skilled at building brands and staying safe is in that licensing game because it is going to be a, we're going to reach a point where it's going to be raw materials that, you know, People can launch beverages across any state. Cannabis will get that way to some point. Um, I think if you really, you know, have the money and you want to make money in one of those big deals, uh, you know, go create a processing facility, get a processing license, because then you can service every key that comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. And plus make your own brands. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of people being successful. I think cultivation is super important. Genetics are super important, but we know what happens to farmers in America. And so that's actually the good thing about vertical integration is those companies are actually being able to like sustain good farming practices. But, you know, who knows what happens when we go legal? It's it's going to be, you know, the, the the American farmer's life is subsidized right now. So I don't know what it's going to happen. What's gonna, that's going to do for the American cannabis farmer. Yeah, a, yeah. Lot of, a, lot of, a lot of what ifs here. Yeah. The, um, um, uh, you know, I want to talk about how you guys market your product. You know, what what are the specific mediums that you use? Uh, not necessarily the strategy, but what are the tactics? So would that be email? Would that be just boots on the ground face to face? Would that be videos? What have you what do you guys what did you do when you launched these products uh, or what what are you doing um, specifically? So let's start with you, Keith. Sure. We, we typically focus on leveraging the community itself. So um, we've got a number of influencers, of artists, musicians that are all part of, some of them are sitting on our cap table. Some of them are, are we're partnered with. And, you know, that's part of the thing that we're doing is that I think is a little bit unique uh, to most of the brands that are, that are currently launching out there is that we're really launching things from, you know, a, a, an authentic place. And, you know, before COVID, we were very focused on live events, you know, um, whether it be industry events within the cannabis industry or music events or, 
cultural events, we would always try, have that, some activations. And because of our some of our strategic partnerships, we were able to do that in a very cost effective way because we would have access to being able to have free real estate and a lot of these activation points. Um, and so for us, I think it's a little bit unique uh, how how we 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 handle our marketing. Um, but you know we're certainly leveraging when you talk about tactics it's just you know you 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 leverage your you know you try to build your email list as much as you can um and use email but then leveraging the socials uh mm -hmm. you know we have traditionally done most of our marketing via um our influencers uh instagram pages you know because they can do and say a lot more things than we can you know on our own instagram page mm -hmm. And to your point earlier, Ben, you have to be careful about what you say and how you position things. And, you know, unfortunately, at least when you're talking about, you know, government regulations, you can go look up what the regulations are. Um, you know, the, the, the terms and services of most of these social media sites are pretty opaque, you know, and they're one line. Yeah. <laughs> they're all one line. Federally legal, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It literally is and one line. I, it's my, it, yeah, frustrating. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it is. Uh, but you know, I've actually been hearing a lot now where people are really starting to leverage Twitter because I think Twitter is actually one of the most open. I mean, I think there's actually full on porn on Twitter right now. You know, um, there's you know there's a lot of restrictions though. Like obviously, Facebook is challenging. You can't do the you know you can't you know buy Google AdWords you know the same way um, Amazon. Amazon, yeah. yeah, you know, there's just the, the challenges. So you just have to kind of figure out. But I mean, I do think that, you know, one key um, strategy or tactic that I would recommend is figuring out how to leverage your audience or influencers or because they're not saddled with a lot of these same issues that you as a company are right. They can go out and kind of talk about things the, however they want. They want to talk about them. Um, so, you know, that, th those are just a few of the things that come, come to mind. I mean, there's a number of different, you know, strategies and tactics that you, 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 you have to, uh, you know, explore and look into. Um, but those are just a couple. Good guys. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a mixed bag for me. I mean, you know, the key driver for Tetragram has always been, you know, the dispensary. So we go to each dispensary, boots on the ground, knocking on the door, creating those relationships. And then once we get into the dispensary, we really start to dig our teeth into the bud tenders because those are the ones who are the customer facing. They're with the customer every day, interacting with them. You know, customers are always asking the bud tender, what's what's new? What's what do we have now? What's what's the latest thing that's out? And so with the bud tender be able to speak to the customer and say, hey, well, have you checked out Tetragram? This is a great way for you to keep track of your products. You know, that's been very effective for us, um, as well as the medical professionals that reside in some of these dispensaries. Like here in Maryland, every dispensary has to have a clinical director. And so with that clinical director, you know, providing assistance to the customer, you know, they're always telling the customer you should keep some type of journal. That's a great position where a, a touch point for us where we can have that clinical director say, hey, have you heard of Tetragram? This is a great way to keep track of what you're using. Um, but even more so than that, like really diving in and being part of the community is huge because, you know, cannabis has a really negative history, a nasty history. And so now that cannabis has become legal in multiple states, you know, more than half the union, there's a lot of people with extreme passion for this plant because they've known how beneficial it's been from a medical perspective since day one. And so, you know, they're really helping drive into force. So we definitely tap into those organizations that have significant grassroots reach um, and are just doing things for the right reasons. But, you know, one of the things that's always been key to Tetragram as well is that I'm a patient, my two business partners are patients. And so that, that speaks volumes because on a lot of our marketing material, you will see that cannabis, excuse me, Tetragram built for patients by patients. And so, again, that's tying into that community, showing that we're here with you. We're going through the same process as you. I mean, I've been in this industry six years and it took me two years to find a product that works best for me. Mm -hmm. So that just shows how vast the landscape is. 
and you really need to this uh, utilize the network and you know form those relationships in order to get in front of the consumer. Yeah, it does help that you're living your brand. You know, you you are you you can speak authentically because you you search for that, develop the product for that, so you can talk authentically about it, which is uh, big. No matter what medium you're going into, authentic conversations with your audience definitely win. So, how about you, Justin? Yeah, I would say when I first started, um, something that I really had to dive into. I'd always been a consumer. Um, but was very much in just the advertising world, right? I had a bunch of buddies at the ad agency that smoked too, and that was maybe kind of like my crew that I hung out with. I uh, never really dove too, uh, too deep into the community here in New York. I, when I lived in LA and <clears throat> Seattle, I had access as a medical patient, right? And so um, one thing I, you know, that I want to echo that Oda said was really about the community stuff. Um, you know, I was lucky to meet Ryan Lepore, who's the deputy director of NYC Normal. Uh, also works over at a, a company called uh, Presto Doctor. And uh, he got me very involved in the, the advocacy work, um, you know, talking about uh, uh, marijuana justice, making sure that we, you know, we addressed a lot of the issues. You know, when we talk about a nasty history in New York, so, uh, uh, up top uh, with some of this stuff that has been, you know, done in the policing of cannabis. Um, so I, I, I actually got, you know, lucky that I came in through that way. I got connected with all the, the local uh, women at Women Grow, um, and just continued to grow my community with the people that were actually a part of the local community. So I was actually, um, you know, kind of accepted at a at a local New York advocate level, and that gave me credibility. So when I started talking more about it on, you know, the channels that I really, uh, you know, exploited would be LinkedIn and 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 Instagram. Instagram is really where I have probably more of a consumer audience. Um, and then LinkedIn is where I've really started to build my professional audience and transition myself from uh, an advertising and, and startup expert into a, a cannabis expert in terms of the content I'm creating. Um, and then, you know, one other thing that Keith said in, in regards to influencers is, um, and just influencers in general, it's about, you know, I'm building a community of people. Oda is too, Keith is too with his product. We're all doing it in different ways. Oda and I both have kind of a digital version of it specifically but to what key was saying is you find people that when you give them a little bit of energy they just radiate it out you know that's that's what you want to find they can be an influencer or they can be a normal person i have you know probably like 20 or 30 people who are regularly posting stuff on bud's feed and that doesn't sound like a lot but that's that's people who are invested in it and sharing cool stuff and you know you do stuff to make those people feel special because they're really contributing to um, to everybody else who's who's experiencing the brand. So finding those people that just with a little bit of nourishment can can really um, uh, you know from the brand and a little bit of attention really will go out there and be a cheerleader for you because they really believe in what you're doing. Yeah, the, the passion, the relationships, and belief in the brand those seem to be common themes here. You know throughout this. Throughout this, so I'm, I've got the last question for you guys, which is, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are la launching a product, either in the cannabis space or any space? Doesn't have to be cannabis. What would be the top, you know, say three things that that you would say to entrepreneurs who are thinking about launching a product? Go ahead, Keith. <laughs> you, you kind of cut, cut out there. We did. Keep start over there. Yeah, we didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I did. You cut out for a second. Yeah. So first of all, show up with your bullet bulletproof vest um, because you're going to be. If you're a pioneer, you're going to be taking arrows in the front and in the back, and you know, bring a thick hide and a thick skin because this is not not easy. You know, uh, this 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 industry is unlike any other industry that is out there right now. But really, what I'd say, I'd say first of all, if if you're, if you're going to bring a, a product to market is truly make sure that that there's that there is a market for this this product mm -hmm. you know so is there you know not just because you think it's a cool idea like make sure that there's truly a market for this before you spend all the time and energy because you're going to have to spend way longer way more time way more money than you ever expected when you first started. you cut cutting out there keith 
Couldn't, can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, Otha, why don't you jump in there? Keith, we can't hear you. So go ahead, Otha. Yeah, so to add to what Keith was saying is, you know, everyone thinks they have a great idea, but is that great idea really going to be addressable to the market? And so, you know, testing your idea by doing a lot of research, due diligence to see if people would actually use your product or buy your product is key, number one. Um, you know, I do love the fact that entrepreneurs always never take no for an answer, but you know, when it comes to initially putting together the framework of your company, you really need to see if it's going to be a viable option. Um, secondly, and especially in this industry, is you just have to have passion and understand uh, cannabis and the history that it's uh, that is tied to it. Um, because again, there's so many advocacy groups in this industry um, because of the nasty history associated with cannabis. So you really have to be passionate about it and understand the medicinal value that it holds. Because if you're jumping into this industry just to make a buck, you're going to get pointed out very quickly. Um, and yep. you're, not, you're not going to last a long time. There's no longevity when you're just in something with no passion. Um, so that's first and foremost. And then you know, one of the things I will tell people is to look at the ancillary side. You know, you don't always have to have a brick and mortar dispensary or, or be a grower. You know, when, when people ask me like, hey, I really want to be a grower. I say, do you like growing tomatoes? And in most cases, they say no. I mean, farming is a 24-7 job, always open, never closed. And so, you know, look at your, your skill set, see what you bring to the table and then capitalize on that and don't just jump into something because you think that's going to be the more lucrative play. It's good. Yeah. I think uh, Keith called it the bulletproof vest. I just say, you know, get ready to get kicked in the gut. There's a lot of uncomfortable things that like will make you feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, your PayPal might just get shut down. You know, you're getting your selling t-shirts and they don't care. You know, you might lose your Instagram account. There's a lot of stuff that like, seems like it should be a lot easier. And those are trivial, frankly, compared to some of the other stuff that you have to think about accountants, lawyers, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that you have to prepare for. And, you know, you should also prepare for, there's going to be some people in your community that give you a lot of support and think it's really cool. And there's going to be some people that kind of keep their distance. And it's not because they like, think you're a bad person or something like that. It's just like, they don't even understand the world that you're living in anymore. You know, like I come from the advertising world. So I'd say the majority of my network stayed intact, but it's, you know, it's, it takes a while actually. Like when I, when I won the Clio for, for, uh, or I got recognized for the Clios for Buzzfeed stuff, that's the first time I saw some of these people kind of come back into my life to congratulate me, you know? Mm. Um, but so, so, you know, kicked in the gut, um, I'd say, you know, one thing that's always valuable is if you have a good idea, you know, consider approaching it with partners or, you know, whether those are official partners or not, have other people in your community and in your corner to work with. Because like, I, I, I think everybody here, like I could probably call on the phone for some advice, you know what I'm saying? So, um, Keith, I, I'm meeting you today, but I know the other two, I could do that. So, um, you know, so I think it's important to have some level of partners. I'm, I'm hitting you up, I got an idea. Um, and then um, the last thing, and I mentioned it earlier, don't be shocked by the scale, right? I think if you're on a, you know, for, for me in a media business, like I'm used to working with the oaths and the Verizon medias of the world, like where they're talking, we're talking about billions and billions and billions of impressions. So comparatively, it's, it's, it's hard to compare to some of the stuff, you know, I, I used to spend 90 million bucks on behalf of a large financial services brand every year. And you can only imagine how big those numbers were. So you got to recognize the scale uh, is going to be different. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of little um, things to get used to, I guess, unless you're in the dispensary business, then you might be like, this is the most popular retail store I've ever ran. <laughs> I think those guys are actually oftentimes getting crushed, which is great, but. Yeah, you know, I think that, that I'd echo the, the you utilize your network really is the biggest thing, because if you try to do it all on your own, like any business, like any product, you know, you need to see if they're if somebody's going to buy it. So you need to test it, whether that's an MVP, a minimum viable product, uh, or if you just, you know, sell one unit of something, you know that, that it's commercially viable. You know, you can, there, there are thousands, millions of good ideas that people have. 
every day, but bringing something to market is very challenging. So if you can sell one unit and then you can sell two, then sell three, you know you have a viable business, but it's very difficult to do that on your own. You've got to utilize partners out there. And this, this uh, industry typically is kind of, you know, close to the vest, don't share information. But what I've seen over the past two, three, four years, and increasingly so, are the companies that share information, cooperate, utilize strengths and weaknesses are the ones that can actually grow market share as opposed to the, the ones that can just say, I will do this all myself. So yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that, uh, Benjamin. Um, you know, you really have to utilize the network. Like I always like to say, your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. um, and given that this industry seems so large from the outside looking in, it's a very small industry. Everyone knows everyone. And yep. given that companies are scaling at such a rate, you know, people are switching positions, switching companies very often. And so, you know, you never know where one connection might lead you six months from now. So. LinkedIn has been crucial for me in terms of uh, helping me establish more relationships um, and grow Tetragram. It's great. Yeah, add in real quick, Ben, that um, I think, you know, having started seven years ago was interesting. Everyone was, how do we all work together in this industry? We're all going to change the world together. It was all sort of kumbaya. It was great. And then the big money came in there for a minute. And then it was like knives out. It was like no one wanted to work with each other anymore. And everyone was like, everyone thought that they could do everything themselves. And and now I feel like, you know, after sort of the cash crunch that hit, you know, the back half of 2019 and then COVID, I feel like we're really back to this where, you know, I'm really seeing an openness to people working um, and partnering. And, and I think also people are recognizing that there's really no other industries where you know, one company does everything, right? It's like, there's reasons why they're specialized, you know, companies that just do these things. So focus on what you're good at and then partner with other companies that do the things that you're not good at, right? And then, you know, and then when you work together, I think the greater, um, you know, the whole, you know, that whole will be greater, you know, than the individual parts. So I think it's a good point that you bring up, Ben, of like leveraging either your current network or new network. And I agree with the like, LinkedIn has been amazing, you know, uh, for, uh, in fact, I found one of my primary supply chain partners through LinkedIn, you know, that I didn't even know from all my other years of being in the industry. So um, I think it's a new world we're in. And for me, it's, it's actually really exciting. I think it's actually starting from a much healthier place now. We kind of went through that crazy boom bust of like you know the funny money that was flowing in from the canadian public markets and all that that wasn't really based on business fundamentals you know um so um yeah so i think i think it's 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 a super exciting time to be in the industry and uh, i'm excited to be in it with all with all you guys you know i know that uh uh Otha and justin we're just now meeting but i'm excited to kind of made this connection and look forward to kind of keeping things going moving forward yeah, right. likewise. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, you guys, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, let's start with you, Keeve. How can people get a hold of you other than LinkedIn? Uh, what are some websites they can check out, and then obviously they can direct message you. But where would you direct people to learn more? Yeah, so my email is Keeve, which you can see I think on the screen there, K I E V E at engagerbrands.com. Uh, engagerbrands.com is our website. Uh, we also have, you know, for our individual brands, it's the it's uh, theheavygrass.com and industrialstrength.co, uh, uh, which I didn't talk about, but that's our next brand that will be coming out. And yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, that's, a, that's a good place to reach me as well. Sounds good. Ota? Yeah, best place to reach me is through LinkedIn. Uh, my email is <laughs> crazy. <laughs> so uh, LinkedIn is definitely the best way to reach me. And you could always download the app, whether you're an Apple user or an Android user um, at the Apple Store or Google Play with this Tetragram app. Um, please feel free to check out our website as well as tetragramapp.com. And on our Instagram, whether that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter is shut down right now. So I <laughs> got to get that restarted. <laughs> Uh, but Instagram and Facebook, we can be found at the Touchagram app as well. Sounds good, Justin. Cool. Yeah, you can find me at budsfeed.com. That's B-U-D-S-F-E-E-D.com. 
Um, there's actually a little chat bubble right in the in the site. And uh, if you click on that and send me a message, I'll respond to you. Um, you can also follow us on social. Uh, on Instagram, it's at BudsFeed underscore. Same thing on Twitter. Um, you know, it's either me or a member of my team always re responding. You can also go follow at uh, at getting chill. This is one of the products that we're bringing to market right now. I have the real one outside. This is the box. Uh, it's going to be the world's first uh, double wall uh, stainless steel vacuum insulated smoking apparatus. Um, so we're excited to be launching that here really soon. So that's that's got a bit of broader audience than just BudSpeed. But um, yeah, we're pretty excited about this. So follow at getting chill if you're interested in learning more about that. Great. Sounds good. Uh, any last words for the audience, guys? Download Petrogram today. <laughs> Sign up for budsfeed.com. There you go. Go to Cali, get your heavy grass. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, I really appreciate your, your time here. Uh, this is a new format for those of you out there watching these panel discussions. The next one will be next Thursday, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and it's going to be on uh, the changing uses of cannabis in professional sports. So tune in. So everyone have a great day. Thanks, guys. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you. Have a good one.